All right, so you're going to tolerate having somebody from the University of Toronto <laughs> here in Hamilton. But I'll tell you a secret. Um, way back uh, when I was uh, working at Mount Sinai Hospital in audiology, I had the privilege of being on a Health and Welfare Canada committee with Dr. Patterson. That was 30 years ago. And we did a report on the needs of older adults in terms of their hearing. And then later, I kept meeting people in the clinic who had hearing problems, and we gave them hearing aids, and we did the best we could, but they'd come back and say, you know, but I still can't do this thing that I want to do. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, we have to look at a bigger picture, and then I went to study cognitive psychology. And then I got to work with Allison, because she does vision and I do hearing, and we had some grants together. And I've also had one of my first uh, chances to do research with people living in long-term care here in Hamilton, working on a project in the 90s with the Hamilton Wentworth District Health Council. So now I live in Oakville, so I'm kind of, kind of, my heart is in Hamilton, even if I so get paid in Toronto. <laughs> so, so I'm okay, I'm okay, okay. And I've kind of evolved from that interest in hearing, which is the most common of, well, it's about the third most common of all the chronic disabilities. But, you know, to me, of the kinds of things we're talking about tonight, because we're not talking about arthritis and cardiovascular and things like that, I don't think, maybe Chris will. But hearing loss is huge. A lot of people have it. But as Allison says, these sensory problems kind of roll into cognitive problems. And now I'm kind of pushing my frontier a little further to, and how does it affect you in your everyday life? And what is the social importance of it? And I have a little quote. And this little quote was actually given to me by uh, an older woman who came to hear a lecture about aging and hearing. And it was somebody who had a hearing loss. And at the end of the lecture, she gave me this little note and she said, when you're hard of hearing, you struggle to hear. It's that cognitive effort. When you struggle to hear, you get tired. When you get tired, you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you get bored. When you get bored, you quit. And then she said, I'm so happy I didn't quit today. So we're going to talk about use it or lose it, but I guess another way you could think about that, and I want you to go out tonight and think, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. If there's something I want to do, I'm going to find a way to do it. So you've heard things like an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, so eating good is part of a healthy lifestyle. Exercising is part of a healthy lifestyle. Being mentally active is part of a healthy lifestyle. As Allison said, a lot of older people have the time to learn a musical instrument or learn a language or take up being active as volunteers. So I want to add to that list that keeping active as a communicator is probably even more important than all of those things. So why is communication so important? And, I, and I'm going to give you three reasons. So communication is important because it's how we define ourselves and how we define our relationships with everybody else. So our personal identity and our group identity, that is how we know who we are. So I don't just mean communication like with your neighbor, that's huge, but it's also communicating with the world. You know, it's when your microwave beeps, it's when the fire ambulance, uh, fire truck or ambulance comes down the street. It's when there's rain on the roof like there was last night. Okay, so you know what's happening in the world. That's a kind of a communication between you and the world. And you also have communication to keep control of yourself. You know, in the agriculture school, they actually teach about uh, hearing and vision and smell and taste. You now, well, why do you teach about hearing in the agriculture school? Because it's not an apple unless it crunches. And you know, you can regulate your breathing, you can, you can keep track of your own body and your own self, and that's a form of communication too. So communication is just, you know, who are we if we don't communicate? The other thing I think is fantastic about communication is to do it. 
you have to have good sensory systems, you have to have a motor system, you have to be able to talk and you have to be able to wave your arms around. Um, if you're communicating by dancing, you'd have even more motor activity. You have to have all those cognitive things, the memory and the attention. And voila, the missing element is the social dimension. So you communicate, you do it all. You are using all of your body and all of your brain to the max. So it's like the extreme workout that will keep you uh, in good shape. And communication has been pretty ignored, but I think it's, it's going to see its day. And my third reason for why communication is such a great thing that you should lose, uh, I'm sorry, sorry, you should use so that you don't lose it, is that maybe it actually keeps you healthy in other ways too. And this is a bit of a, bit of a thing to think about here. So one of the definitions, we were talking a little bit earlier about adapting, and, and there's a definition of health that I really like, and it's a definition from one of my uh, colleagues from health promotion uh, when I worked at the University of British Columbia. So Jim Frankish and his colleagues defined health as the capacity of people to adapt to, to respond to, or to control life's challenges and changes. Okay, so your life is gonna change. The world is changing really fast. If you're a healthy person, you can go with the flow. You can keep uh, up with those changes and you are going to survive and do well. And I would say, especially for human beings, especially in 2013 and in the future, Communication is your most important vehicle to help you to change. Getting information, using information is really important. So with that kind of idea about health, communication is important. Now I did, I did you know, work on hearing loss for a long time, so I, I thought I'd say a little bit about that just in case you're interested. Because hearing loss, you know, Allison said, there are losses, but there are also gains in aging. And hearing loss, unfortunately, is one of those things that um, does decline for a lot of people. And those declines actually start when you're in your 40s. So around the same time you're getting your reading glasses, you start to notice it's a little harder when you go to a party. It's okay with your wife or your husband in the living room and it's okay if you're just watching TV, but it's really hard if you go to a party. Anybody kind of relate to that? People are nodding, okay. So this difficulty in noise is kind of the first sign. And Allison mentioned this, and I'll kind of say the same thing a different way. What we found in the lab is that if you take up information when it's nice and quiet, you actually remember it better than if you take up information and noise. So it's really important uh, to make sure that you have good quality information coming in because otherwise you can't do all that other stuff that you'd like to do with it, like remember it. So we have a cascade from changes in hearing to changes in things like memory. You have to concentrate harder, you have to pay attention harder to get the same information. But as Allison said, our brain has got this fantastic ability to reorganize. And you know, if vision is back here, hearing is kind of here, still mostly you know, at the back, and the part of your brain at the front that in fact old people are fantastic at using allows people to hear things like conversation because all of one of the things that people are good at that's very well preserved cognitively is knowledge. You know, so if you came to my lab and I did a vocabulary test on you, the 70-year-old is gonna have a much better vocabulary than a 20-year-old. So that's an asset. And you use all that knowledge that is you know, functioning at the front of your brain to kind of compensate. Allison used that term, compensate, uh, so that you can get the job done of understanding. So you have ways of, of maneuvering through this and getting the job done and you don't have to quit. 
Now, actually, what I've told you about so far would not be the kind of thing that would take you to an audiology clinic because actually the people I've been talking about so far who we study in the lab, they have actually fantastic ability to hear pins drop. So it's this more complicated dealing with noise that's their problem. But some people do lose the ability to hear quiet sounds. And about 50% of people, by the time they're around 70, will have enough of that type of loss that they might go to an audiology clinic. And actually 70 is about the average age of when people first get a hearing aid. It all starts when you're 40, you know there's problems, but it can take a couple of decades before you actually are gonna to go to a clinic to do anything about it. I don't wanna get a hearing aid because it'll make me look old. So there's some kind of weird connection between getting used to these uh, problems and actually accepting being old and, and uh, knowing that you can do things and that just because you're old doesn't mean you can't do things. And I'm going to kind of finish with a really kind of provocative headline that you've probably seen in the news, that this connection between hearing and cognition, if we take it to hearing loss, you've probably seen that headline that uh, some researchers in um, the US have made, in fact, last week there was an article in Journal of uh, American Medical Association, again showing that people with hearing loss are more likely to have dementia in the future. So why is that? And nobody knows why. They know there's a connection, but nobody knows why. Maybe it's because of biology and there is something that goes wrong, that goes wrong first in your ears and later in your brain. But the hypothesis that I love and which the authors propose as a possibility is that maybe the connection is because of social activity. So if you have a hearing loss, instead of going for it, if you decide to quit, you're going to drop out of your social activities. And if you drop out of your social activities, you're not gonna be using your brain so much. And if you don't use your brain so much, maybe it's gonna deteriorate. So maybe there is actually a social connection, um, which is really important and that we're just going to begin to understand. So I'm gonna stop there. And we're gonna have lots of communication tonight, so everybody's gonna do just fine.